Okay. Julia. Needs shrugs. Jacinta. Helen. Julia. Kayla. Lacan. Okay, we're not going to be playing the nice fine box. Just go, just go, just go. Just go. Yeah. What's happening? <laughs> start, start, start the meeting. Have to, be, have to deal with chaos ball. <laughs> start the meeting. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. A bit over half an hour ago, I had a bad coughing fit. And uh, the cough, damn nuisance, and what it stirs up inside, and, and the cancer stirs all that up, and the pain's terrific, a bad way. Came in here and sat down, and as you all arrived, it settled down. And uh, quite okay again. You've got to remember from that that what comes into this room, the energy. We can't hear you. The energy that's brought into this room by each and every one of you. If every one of you were in a bad way, that'd be a terrible thing because we'd all be in a way. But some are feeling quite happy and well and others can take it on and we can all settle down into the natural state that life essence the space-like awareness in which everything patterns, shapes and forms and appears as In its unicity, there can't be any problems at all, but when it's singular, we take it on as a singularity, a separation. It'll be like it was here, a lot of pain and misery. And that's what goes on with a lot of us. We take ourselves to be this separate entity this individual, this person. And we've got the concepts about this person. Some of us think we're pretty good. Some of us are not so good. And we've all got different concepts about ourselves, and not only ourselves, but the world as it appears around us. And what do the ancients point out? They point out there's only one essence. Only one life, one intelligence energy, one being. Only that. <clears throat> and everything is that. And get the taste of that. And how are you going to continue to be miserable, fearful, or anxious, or unhappy? Take a look at life, not only in this room, but outside. And see, it's functioning quite all right. Though it can appear, and it must, and can only appear, as its opposite. If there was no opposites, what could you express it to or what or about if there wouldn't be how could there be you or anything other and so in its absoluteness it doesn't know itself it just is pure being but to express and know itself in all these 
pattern shapes and forms in the great variety it, which it does express, it needs to vibrate. And in that vibration, it forms patterns, shapes, and forms. And each pattern, shape, and form is a unique expression of the one. Improve, improving the great intelligence of it all that it can express in all this variety, in all this diversity. When this pattern here learnt words and identified itself for what my parents had pointed out, that I was this person, I was Bob, the individual, it was taken on board without question because they didn't tell me to question it. And I went to school and nobody at school told me to question it. Each one reinforced the belief that we're all, and that I was just separate a being, a separate entity, a person, an individual. And all came about with the learning of words. For the first couple of years of this life, which I can't say anything about because I had no words for it. I couldn't say I was born, or I did this, or did that, or anything about it at all until the word came about. People could tell me what, parents could tell me what I did and what happened and all the rest of it. But of this self, I couldn't say anything. And then fussing around me, they were repeating words, talking to themselves and pulling words at this pattern. I picked up on the words and continued to believe in the words because nobody pointed me out any different. And I went to school and all the school kids around me and everybody else were in words, all believing they were separate. And then in that sense of separation, they became like, dislike, like to some of the other kids, some I didn't. All sorts of states, different patterns, shapes and forms. And take on a lot of the beliefs that were there and a lot was happening here, how it felt and what it was like. And this conceptual image I had continued to grow. It took me deeper in the belief that I was this person and if things weren't going the way I thought it should, thought about the feelings and the emotion through the thoughts that came. And so there was anger, there was anxiety, there was depression, guilt, shame, remorse, jealousy, envy. <coughs> All these things going on, adding to this pattern, sometimes it was good, sometimes it was terrible. But the more and more concepts were taken up, up, on, upon, the less and less it was a settling in to the immediacy, the silence, the stillness, that in which the joyousness and sense of well-being arose and expressed. There were periods of it when everything was happy, but they didn't last for very long. And this went down the road, like a lot of people do, into the deepest, deep states of anxiety, guilt, shame, remorse and fear, psychological suffering, and addictions, and other things came up, all with the idea of becoming better, not realising I was looking in the wrong direction, trying to become something instead of recognising which I did in later stages when I turned around and started to look along the lines 
of others that were expressing it, that it wasn't separate at all. It was the one essence happening, shaping, forming, experience, expressing as everything. And it was all taking place in that space emptiness, which they call the space-like awareness. Awareness which is like space. Space is no thing. Here in this room now, and every so-called thing which is you, me, and the curtains, the blinds, the windows, the room itself, the lights, are all the content of that space. But like the things were taking place in my mind when these thoughts were going on, there was a lot of separation, there was a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear. But space, if you like to notice it, It is not moving. It doesn't have any beginning. It's not expressing or doing anything. It's clear, silent, still and empty. No beginning, no ending, no centre, no circumference, no point anywhere can you give it any shape or form. But all the things in it including this pattern and every other pattern, the trees, the flowers, the insects, the birds, were all the content of the space. Was the space corrupted or contaminated by any of it? Have a look at it. Look out the window. Look around in this room. Look between these patterns that are in the scene. See, that, that space is untouched. It's clear. It's still. It's silent. It's empty. It is really no thing. And I mean by that thing, it hasn't got any pattern, shape or form. And everything appears in space. But the space is no thing. Now, is the appearance the thing? The appearance is not it. Appearance is the thing, the shape and form, that appears. But the shape and form and the patterns are not real. They appear to be so. But they are transient. They're changing. Every pattern, shape and form in this manifestation is changing. There is nothing static about any of it. But the basic space of phenomena, and that's how they point it, as the basic space, the base of all phenomena is that space which is no thing and everything appears in it or on it or around it or about it, can't be around it or about it because it is a content that's all contained in that space. And there's nothing you can think of or postulate that can be outside of that space. So the things that are appearing in it which are not the space, but they appear in the space and they couldn't appear without space. So the very essence of them, or the life of them, that means you, me and everything else must be that space. That space like intelligence, energy or awareness. That each and everything is. And how it appears is what they call a phenomena manifestation. The definition of phenomena is that which appears to be. It's all manifest, it's all there in front of you, the, the people that are around you and everything like that and the, the things that are around you all appear to be real. But without the space, what could they appear in? And can you separate any of the things that are in space, from that space. <coughs> because when that vibration or life that's in all these things disappears and it all drops back into the space again, 
as you know yourself. When this fat in the body dies, in, you know what death is. You see it all around you. It's the cessation of life. It ceases. And when these bodies cease, they're put into a box and buried or put in a fire and burnt. And as they say in the scriptures, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And those ashes do dissolve into dust. And the body rots down and dissolves into dust. And the dust dissolves into space. Where else can it go? We talk about reincarnation and more birth. They've got this idea that this pattern can go on and continue. But it's never been anything other than an appearance. Like the movie. The movie appears on the screen. All sorts of activities are going on. The movie's been made, of course, but it's using the same thing to, to see that the pattern shapes and forms that is appearing in the basic screen, that screen is not touched or corrupted by the movies. And a movie can be violent or peaceful or loving. All things at all can happen in it. But the movie is not contaminated, the, the screen is not contaminated or corrupted by any of it. And it's available for more movies to appear in it. And the movies can have happy endings or bad endings. What difference does it make when it's realised that it was only an appearance? And you can lock into the drama or the thing of it and feel sorrow or unhappiness or pain for a little while. But after a while it's remembered it's only a movie. And it settles down and put in the, in the memories that it was a good movie or a bad movie or it stirred up the feelings or emotions here. <coughs> Not realising this life we're living, we are the actors. The patterns, shapes and forms that are playing these roles which the life energy or the intelligence formulates in its vibration and the way it functions and patterns. And it's seemingly solid, substantial, real, until it's investigated, until it's looked into. And they say, and the way they tell you to look into it and find it, that the false cannot stand up to investigation. How often do we look into it? Realise we go along with life looking in the mind, thinking we're going to change it, make it better, or improve on it, or revenge about this, or do something about that, and all the rest of it, all these concepts come up, all trying to become something. And we learnt a lot of words. And we weren't born with any words. And one of the words we learn is becoming. We think we can become something. But what does that mean when you look into it? It implies a future time. It's not happening right now, but if I do this and remember this, it will become something. And there is this idea, this concept of time going on. Past, present, future. And it's believed, that's seemingly believed to be real too. <coughs> I did this at such a such time and I remember it and think of it. But can you go back and live in the past again? And you realise you can't go back and live it. You can recall some of it, you can't recall all of it. But what you're recalling, when's it happening? You were thinking about yesterday. When are you thinking about it? You're thinking about it right now. Or it can be something about what we call the future. 
we anticipate what we're likely to do in the future. Anticipate and imagine. So past is dead and gone. It only can be recalled. It can't be lived again. And if you have a look at that, can you recall everything you did yesterday? You can't. There are certain parts that happened and they're gone. And they're good for good. Gone for good. And there's what you're recalling today. You might be able to call in a couple of months' time. That'll be gone also. So whatever the past there ever seemingly was can only be recognised right now. The future, what you're anticipating and imagining. What's that anticipation and imagine? When is that happening? It's happening right now about a presumed future. And when it comes to the future, it might have happened like that or it may not have. <coughs> but something will be going on in the future and that will be like the past. It will be happening presently. And they call it presence awareness. <coughs> this immediate, spontaneous presence. And break that down to pre-sense. Before the sensations come up, there's fear, anxiety, depression, love, hate, or whatever they come in. Just be with this spontaneous presence. What is wrong with right now if you're not thinking about it? If you're not putting a concept on it, a image on it, about what you'll do or what you might do or what you did or trying to undo or whatever, what was, what you, what was done. <coughs> so you don't have to look at enough for very much to realise that there is only this presence awareness. And the other way they put it too is non-conceptual, ever fresh presence awareness. What have we been doing up till now? We've been conceptualising this presence awareness. All sorts of concepts on this or that or this will happen or that will happen. All sorts of concepts, words. And it might, and it might not, but it goes on. And the conceptualising goes on. And with the concepts, which are nothing but mental constructs, all sorts of patterns, shapes and forms appear as they are conceptual. And it becomes back to the same old habit. Past, future, patterning, shaping and forming, thinking, feeling, emotion, thought, feeling, emotion, getting locked into the words. And they point out again, in the beginning was the word. And when you look at that, you see, when did you begin? You yourself didn't begin to learn that word, yet you were born a couple of years before that. You can't remember it because you had no word, you couldn't say it. I was born. So what about this nature, this life? They said the world or the cosmos had a beginning. And in the, in the beginning was the word. You realise it, see, instead of saying, realise what it really means. That begins, it begins with the word, like it begins here with the word. This whole manifestation. The word was with God. They put the label God on it. And God is another word. They put a word on the word trying to make one word better than the other. All things were made by him. By the word. And that's true. That's true. Anything in this room we haven't got a word on. And there was nothing made that was made without the word. And it goes on to say the word was made flesh. In other words, these pattern shapes and forms, these bodies, were broken down into the flesh, bones and patterns that they are and dwelt among us. Nothing but the Word.
What is the word? Take the word water. Can you drink it? It remains water, the thing we drink. But can you drink the word? Can you swim in it? Can you drown in it? Can you wash in it? And you realise you can't do anything at all with the word. The word fire, can you cook with it? Burn yourself, heat yourself? Can't. Lots of other words, can you do things with them? You can't. What's this word, I or me? Which we believe that this is what I am. I am is a word. And what does this I am represent? We think it, it is this pattern, shape and form, this person. This is what I am is. But it's not that at all. I am is the sense of presence which we recognise that I am that presence awareness and then put the label that the parents are telling on it and it becomes I am Bob or I am Jane or I am this or I am that. We put some label and some belief into it what we think it is not realising it's just a word that needs something to express through. Just the same as all this manifestation that appears in its absoluteness. And it is absolute if it's non-dual, if it's one without a second. If it's absolute, if it's total, what can be added to the totality? Yeah, or the perfection. Can you add anything to the perfect? Or the absolute? It wouldn't have been absolute if anything could be added to it. Can you take anything away from it? That wouldn't have been absolute if you can take anything away from it. So when we talk about absolute and perfection, realise everything is that. And that's what the ancients tell us. That is all there is. That's the great mantra. I am that. And we know that because we say, that's the chair, that's the carpet, that's the tree, that's the flower, that's the world, that's this, that. Everything is that, which we put other words on, which discriminated from the previous one. See, everything as that, now we discriminate it into separate patterns, shapes and forms. No matter whatever pattern shape or form it expresses it as, it's still only that. So if you recognise that everything is that, and you are that, I am that, then what are you going to think about the other? If you recognise that other is the same that that I am, and if it's the same am that that I am, and it's that absolute, what would I want with it? Is it superior to me or is it inferior to me? And what would I want from it? And all this hassle that's going on in the world because I, believing I'm separate and feeling, because of that sense of separation, being insecure, being vulnerable, being unhappy and fearful because it's not sure of what's going on, it reckons it is the absolute, there's nothing superior or inferior to it and doesn't need or want anything from anything else because it's already that. And if there's an opening to that and let it express as it's naturally doing, if I look out there in what we call nature, nature meaning the natural, the natural state, the way that nature itself is functioning. Realise the earth is rolling around the sun. The seasons are coming and going. Tides are coming in and out. Stars and planets are forming, imploding, exploding. Thoughts are coming, thoughts are going. Bodies are appearing, bodies are disappearing. Realise that the pattern shapes and forms, all expressions, all thatness that's expressing. And there is nothing, no thing, that is separate and apart from that. Well, instead of living 
in fear, isolation, anxiety, guilt, depression and unhappiness. Why not recognise see, recognise and see if it's true or not? If that is all there is. And a little bit of investigation and seeing through things, you'll re recognise I'm a little bit more than this body-mind identity. Am I the body? Well, I say my body. And that itself implies there's something that has this body. Who's this me or I that I'm talking about? Am I this mind? Say my mind. Investigate. Is there an I that there's this body? I don't say I body or I mind. I can say I mind in one part, but when there is no minding. By this body, investigate. This body is made up of elements. Through science and all the rest of it, we've learned that it's been acquired by these patterns down through the ages. We realise that this body is made up of elements. The elements are air, fire, water, space. The elements. Take the air out of your body. Wouldn't be a body for much longer, would it? Take the water out of it. After a few days, if you be thirst, you wouldn't be the body again. Take the fire. The heat, the body temperature. You get hypothermia and die. Separate yourself from those elements and there'd be no such thing as a body there. And those, even those elements could be broken down further into subatomic particles into pure energy. So from that one, would you recognise that this body is nothing but a vibrating pattern of energy? And look out there in nature and see. You go down to the ocean, you'll see what you believe to be a blue sea. Now the ocean or sea is nothing but water. Elements. And it appears to be blue. If you can get a bucket of blue water out of the ocean, come back and show, bring it to me and show it to me. So you see, though it appears to be blue, it is not blue. You go outside in a clear day. No clouds in the sky, but a beautiful blue sky. There's a canopy over what we call sky, which is nothing but space. Space is in this room. Where's the blueness? Go outside and in space, where's the blueness? You'll see the blueness is always further out. Go up in a plane, as high as you can. You think you're going to fly into blueness? You know you sure won't, because you investigate it. So you see, though it appears to be so, it's not so. The water in the mirage. You can be taken in, you're driving along in the, somewhere in the distance, it appears to be a pool of water in the mirror. When you drive up there, there's no water there. There never was. And there are many other metaphors which you investigate and see that they point out. One they use is the snake in the rope. A fellow steps out of his cabin on a dark night and stands on a wet piece of rope. And it rolls under his feet. And he immediately thinks he's trod on a serpent, a snake. And the immediate fear comes up in him. The stirring up of the body element. And he can feel the serpent's bite and all sorts of fear and panic comes up in him. Somebody comes out of the cabin and shines a torch. Look, it's only a piece of wet rope. Well, the seeing it and recognising it is an immediate sense of relief. But the fear and the temper, what's been stirred up in the feeling of the body don't die down immediately. They take a little bit of time to settle. So when we get into all these bad feelings of fear, anger and anxiety and we think we get over it, it takes a long time to settle down again. And before it settles down, probably something else has been stirred up that adds to it and keeps adding to it until there's not much time when we 
settle down into the peace, silence and stillness that we already are. Because it keeps coming up in what we recognise and see and take to be unreal, take it to be real. What seemingly, what is actually unreal, taking it to be real, how it appears to be seen. And you'll hear some word somebody will say to you and take it as an affront or somebody is putting some con their concept on you and you think they're calling and believing that you are that. And you'll get angry with them or angry or fearful or depressed and guilty about it. All because we take on these concepts or words. What if I ask the question, what is wrong with right now at this moment if I don't think about it? Well, there's immediately a thought of stop for a second or two here. And there was a recognition, a clear recognition there. If there was no thought or word there, everything was just as it is. And you realise in that seeing without the concept of word, you haven't stopped seeing, haven't stopped hearing, haven't stopped breathing or heart beating. The functioning is going on, but no concepts have been coming up to put the name and form on that which is. And Shakespeare tells of that also, and he says there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So we've got this concept of thinking, and it can be very useful. There are a lot of thoughts come about that helped us invent or make up a lot of machines or other things and words. We learnt many things. But there are a lot of th crappy thoughts come up too and made us believe in other things. Heaven and hell, past and future lives, all ideas and concepts and image about what will happen to me if I don't become something. And being can never be becoming. Timeless, it changes by itself. And each and every one of you sitting there haven't got the same body had three or four years ago, or last week even, if you look at it closely. It's changed. Change from the time you're a little child. Well, give him what to say, I am, then, to the say, I am right now. It's the same life. It's the same words we put on. But it's not the same pattern of energy we're putting on. That's change. I realise that all these pattern shapes and forms are transient. They are not static. The only static thing there is, the only real, is the base in which it all appears. And you find a beginning to space. Have a look, have a think about it. I tell you that the world began with a big bang thousands of years ago. Well, where did that thousand years now? And where's the big bang? What would it have been in? It'd have to be in space, wouldn't it? Because there's nothing you can postulate that could be outside of space. So space is what has never changed. It has no boundaries, no beginning. And it contains everything. And it also contains the no thing in which the everything it says. And the con no thing and the everything are two ends 
of the one stick, two sides of the one coin. Being, knowing, loving to be, sat chit and existence consciousness of bliss, awareness of being is bliss. All different ways of putting the same thing. Anyone who is not unaware right now. Are you unaware right now? You're not unaware, so you must be aware. How many are recognising it? How many do you try and grasp that awareness? Can you? Have we got the word of the label on it? It is no thing that can be grasped. But there is a knowing that there is this life or beingness or awareness or something, something which is really no thing, that's patterning, shaping and forming everything. And it is that one essence, space-like awareness, where things appear in, play around and disappear. They tell you that in the text too. Shiva Shakti. Shiva the god or the static aspect. Shakti his consort, the female aspect of the queen. Shakti dances. Shakti is the vibration of energy that vibrates into all this world and everything in it. So there it is. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Paradise. Everything is going well for them. What happened? They ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. People talk about the apple, but never mind the apple. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What's that? That means they learnt words. And in learning words, they're cast out of We're back into this everyday functioning of what we are when we believe in these words. Recognise that the word is not the thing. Settle back into it. Be that life. Realise that life is ever fresh, ever new, natural and spontaneously. And see what happens. And this crowd here, you wouldn't be here if you hadn't looked into this stuff. And some of you have got a good understanding, a good knowledge of it. Well, don't hesitate to put it out there so that others can hear it. And you look back in the scriptures and all the rest of it, you'll see if it hadn't have been passed down from others right up till now, how could we even talk about it? We'd be stuck completely in the conceptualisation. It'll be worse than what it is today, and it's bad enough now with all the fighting and angst and everything that's going on. The turmoil that's going on. What happens when you settle down to live in life as it is? Have a look at the earth, as I say, natural. It has problems, what's seeming problems to it. can be tempests, or storms, there can be peace, there can be floods, Phantoms, pandas and droughts. There can be pestilence, all sorts of diseases and everything. Everything seemingly occurs in this manifestation. But does the space change? Is it corrupted or contaminated by anything that appears? It doesn't, it can't be. So, you know, if you're looking for a hiding place, somewhere to go where you're going to get rid of it, settle back into your natural state and see that nothing can affect you in that recognition. Even if this pattern breaks down, which it will do. Why it is now, it's just another pattern, another bondage. 
were in the body. Get rid of that and you realise it goes back into the space again. You're free of all the bond, the fetters, all the binding, bondage. And enjoy it now as it's appearing, as it's expressing. And recognise that you are that. That is all I can ever be, is that. That innate intelligence in it, that light. And there is no body, and I mean that, that lives a life. It's not your body. It is the life that's expressing through the body. And it's the life that is using the body. It's the life that's expressing as the mind. And it is the life that is utilising the mind. All appearance, all seemingly so. But no thing the basic space can be added to it, taken away from it. The no thing is the everything, and the everything is the no thing. And you are that. Thank you. <laughs>
I have a question here from Tanya uh, for Bob. She says, I want to ask Bob if patterns of thought changed when the me was seen not to be real, or whether thoughts turn up just as they always had. Gameless thought, more recognition mm. of what is back of the thoughts, the silence is still. Thoughts still came up, and they still come up to this day. Yeah. Because they're seen for what they are. Mm. It can be attached to, or can be let go of. And another aspect of it is, 
whether the thoughts change or not throughout the course of life or a day, nothing stays the same. Mm -hmm. So you will have different thoughts when where you were in primary school. There may be times in life when there is more thoughts or less thoughts. You go for like silent retreat, and that may change too. The thing is what Bob was saying, it's not really that important whether they are thoughts or what sort of thoughts, but whether they are recognized. And the thoughts that usually drop away when he says there is less thoughts, the poor me thoughts, you know, the self-referential thoughts, the self-obsession goes, oh, they shouldn't have said that to me, or I'm not good enough, or all that nonsense is initially is just disbelieved. And then in absence of that energy fueling it, the absence of the belief uh, giving it life, well, they just die out. So you just watch how it is happening within your system uh, without any expectations that it should be a particular way because it was a particular way with Bob because that life essence never duplicates itself. Every situation, every expression is always unique and fresh and new. And thank you for your question. Anyone? Insight? <laughs> Insight? Oh, thank you. Um, just to add to what you were talking about, Kat, I realised a few days ago that there seems to be more space happening here now in between thoughts mm. um, and in between that gap, but the gap is getting wider and there's more, I guess, perhaps sense of peace or sense of no thing happening as well. And then it occurred to me a few nights ago, I'm lying in bed thinking nothing, just like, no. Nah. And then all these, what I would call stupid, nonsense images and thoughts that Tasha doesn't have, like you get to know your own flavour of your own dialogue. <laughs> and it was just like as if I'd switched channels into a foreign country and I was watching their ads and their references. And I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> And then I realised, oh, this is just a thinking apparatus that doesn't actually belong to me. It's just a thinking apparatus. But there's such a a deep groove of familiarity, attachment to identification with the normal flavours of Tasha Channel that I think that's me. As soon as the channel is switched into whatever foreign language, I actually thought, oh, is this a bit of a stroke maybe? <laughs> like is this what happens when you have a little bit of a stroke? And then it kind of dissipated and then there was less usual Tasha because normally Tasha wants to come in and tell me all about it and, you know, we get into this in-depth discussion with ourselves about it. But that kind of like as well. Mm -hmm. And I think I might have had about eight hours sleep, which – it was like almost two or three nights worth of sleep for me because I just don't sleep. Oh, wow. Solid sleep. Mm -hmm. So, like you're purging. Like you're no, letting go stuff. It was more of a case of the recognition of there is space here. This is a thinking apparatus because that's what it's designed to do. Mm. And if you want to look at it from the morphogenic field point of view, there are just thoughts happening. Mm -hmm. And because the the radio station had switched channels, it was so unfamiliar and weird, really. But it was kind of nice as well. <laughs> because then during the week, as issues have been coming up in my personal life, I'm like, hang on a minute, just back up. Is this really happening or is this just the channel that's running right now? Mm. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that. That's beautiful. So thank you. Yeah, that's brilliant. What a, what a freedom to mm. actually just get that solidity of being attached and identified with that one particular channel. Have it suddenly expand. And no, you don't have to be locked in here. Mm. Suddenly the freedom of movement, like wow, the whole field is available. But that's a beautiful way it actually expresses. So thank you. Mm. And we have... Uh, Tanya saying to Bob, thank you, there is no me here, but still patterns appear, but mostly are seen as stories. Mm -hmm. Maybe most thoughts are just stories. 
well, in a way, all of them really. Mm. <laughs> and Catherine says, quote from Nisargadatta, to remain without thought in the waking state is the greatest worship. Bob puts it in this way, what's wrong with right now unless you think about it? Awareness has no thought. Beautiful. And it's called happens. It happens on it. Awareness is unaffected and untouched by thought. So it sounds like this, this quote may actually uh, be mistaken as if Nisargadatta was suggesting people to try and suppress thought. Mm. Totally not, not the case. There are no people to do anything at all. And thought can't be suppressed like sweating can't be suppressed or digestion can't be suppressed by any act of volition from the non-existent entity. But to recognize, like Tasha was saying, you know, you just recognize. You're not doing, you're not purging, you're not letting go. There is no one doing anything. It's just a simple recognition of that space which is always already present, always here. And uh, Tazi says, sometimes I get my head I get in my head and think I'm somebody and I am very easily offended. <laughs> but when I know I am nobody, I can be I can never be offended. And that's a quote from Mike Tyson. <laughs> One of Bob's favorites. <laughs> Thank you, Tazi. Oh, Maureen. Yeah. In the, um, as Bob says, if you don't think about it, then it can't really exist. Mm. You know, thoughts do. So what I've recognised is that thoughts just do their thing because that's the nature of, of nature. So no interference there. So if they arise sometimes, um, because I sit in stillness a bit, I'm able to see them and just let them do their thing. However, the like everything, most thoughts had a corresponding vibration and I think that kind of locks into the body as a habit. So like Bob said before, when a man stands on a rope and he thinks it's a snake and therefore he has the fear, from that moment on the man in the forest has a habit. He may not be thinking about it, but he had, has the habit of fear arising in his, as a vibration. So sometimes if you wake up, you could naturally have a, a just a vibration in you. It could be flat, as an example. It's just there without thinking about it. So from my awareness, I kind of look at it as, well, that's just a habit, but that habit can continue on. Mm -hmm. It's not so much the thoughts anymore. You can see the thoughts. They're just thoughts doing what they need to do. Yeah. And then you can experience the freedom, this beautiful feeling of freedom, whether it's bliss or freedom. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's good. However that habitual tendency of that vibrational feeling that keeps arising. I've been observing it without trying to get attached to it, but it, it has its natural occurrence. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. So I'm interested on your view about that. So if I was to say with Bob says, well, if you don't think about it, it doesn't matter. However, the vibration, because we're this body patterns, it's still arises as that. Yes. So I don't want to label it past, future, whatever. It doesn't matter. But that is the consistency of a rising habit as a vibration that's kind of blocked. It seems to be, you know, so I can observe it, but that vibration is still there without labeling it. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So what does one, how does Bob um, help with that one? Mm. Or suggest? Mm. Oh got a, a, a pot full of cream. Yeah. What was that? So if you've got a pot full of cream, you want to make butter off, out of it. You beat it, beat it, beat it. <laughs> and it'll turn into butter. But if you don't, and it becomes, when it's buttery, it 
the cream has become matter. It's a solid. If you don't beat it enough, you're gonna, it's not going to matter. I like that. So you're saying, so if that habit was to come up, yeah. if you indulge in it, then yeah. it's going to turn to butter as such. Yeah. But just consistently leave it and then it will dissolve itself. Mm. And sometimes it may take years. Mm. I mean, if, you look at the, if you look at the animals, we have a couple of cuts. One of them spooks very easily mm. and another one doesn't. And it is just a habit arising out of the response to the environment. And if your habit is arising in response to the environment, mm. that response may be habituated. If it's responding to the thoughts, that's environment too. Hmm. The arising thought is environment too. But if it is not being fed, if it's not being fueled, over time it will change. That is just the number one rule of the duality, rule of existence. Nothing stays permanent. Everything fluctuates and changes. If it doesn't change, fantastic. Your brain will stop recording it. So it will be gone. <laughs> but because it does change, even in the animal, it does change. You know, if the environment will be more having more of the, you know, spookiness, it will get worse. Yeah. If it will be more safe, it will get uh, better. I mean, less frequent or less strong. The thing is, the cat doesn't have a problem. It doesn't want that habit to go. It doesn't have preference or ideas that I should be different. The no, habit it. is wrong. So the resistance to that habitual mm -hmm. tendency, just the resistance itself, hold yeah. yourself to it. So yeah. letting go of the resistance of that habit of forming, of whatever that vibration in your body is, just stop resisting it, or plus stop beating it up, as mm. Bob said, stop beating the, the cream. The butter. The also, butter. if you just simply recognise that this is the light, this is the intelligence, intelligence energy. In the case of a cat, because it's not personal, it's easy to see that this habit is actually protecting, it is in, in instinct, it is protecting the loving to be of the cat. So there's love behind it, love for being, preserva mm. self-preservation. If you see that the motive behind the habit is always love, mm. it's much easier not to resist it, but to rather appreciate it. And when it is appreciated and completely welcomed into the field of knowing, and really even almost like given a hug, it, w it won't be a source of suffering anymore. And that, then it most probably change even faster. I get it because in that way then it becomes a sense that you're living mm -hmm. life. It's life actually and life is love. So good or bad, it doesn't really matter. Mm. Well, it won't say that easy, but you give it love, then it's, it's life. You're still living and enjoying being present, mm. so to speak. Mm. Miss Sajid Adult would, would also talk about the get, get, I am. Get the mic. Um, yeah, Nisargad Adda would also talk about the I am as as being as as that love as well. So mm -hmm. focusing on that sense of I am, that sense of beingness and aliveness, um, that is love. And mm -hmm. because that we come from love, we re we are love, and we return to love. The very nature of the source of our existence, in which we are, mm -hmm. is love. And so when we focus on that I am, that beingness. That's that Satchitananda again, that sense of bliss or love comes, that's Ananda, mm. um, because that's our very nature. Mm. So even when something, uh, is, you know, a thought that maybe doesn't feel so pleasant or a sensation, that's happening to this, who's that happening to? That's happening to this sense I am. It's happening to that sense of presence and that's and there's love in that. There's, there's this innate feeling that we all want to be. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And this is also not to say, you know, there is a place in the whole dream for fine-tuning of the machine. I mean, the cat can't do that. It can't go for hypnotherapy session or acupuncture session yeah. to fine-tune the machine because sometimes, you know, it spooks out of nothing. Like I move my head, my, my leg on the carpet. Yes, and it's exactly. Just, it's, it's dysregulated. It's not functioning in the optimal way. Mm. We humans have that additional capacity to do some neurofeedback or hypnosis or whatever. And in the quiet mind, the solution lies which created that uh, dysregulation may actually bring the solution 
Bob often talks about the two small voice mm. that will just give it a direction. But this, again, it has to come from a different place than the sense of I'm not enough, I have to fix myself to, be, to deserve love. No. If you know you are the absolute, you are the source of all love and all experiencing. And now the machine through which the expression and experiencing happens needs a little fine tuning. Maybe it has ion deficiency or maybe it has uh, vitamin B, Anita was saying, which causes a little depressive moods or I don't know what may be causing anxiety or stuff. They are tools that, you know, may be used on the machine and without ever affecting that awareness and that bliss of being that you are. Yeah, I, I think it's just the strong observation that I have of it, just because, you know, when you're constantly um, being in the present a lot more than you normally would, you know, because you're just becoming more and more present of everything, I think you also can be very sensitive to anything that does arise. Whereas before, if it was just a habit, because it's a habit, you unconsciously would have followed it through. But because of um, being present with Bob or learning different things, you do become more sensitive to anything that's creeping up. Not so much your thoughts, because you can observe the thoughts and know oh, they're, too, they're too obvious. You can see I'm not the thoughts. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost laughable sometimes. So, but it's just those creeping habits that arise that sometimes, and I call them a habit because they are a product of a thought from somewhere that's mm -hmm. created the vibration in the beginning, you know. So, uh, but I was interested in how Bob would simplify it, as he always does, yeah. to the very simple thing, well, if you don't stir it, <laughs> it's not going to last. So mm -hmm. less attention to that habit like any habit, giving up smoking or alcohol, whatever it is, the same thing. So I got that and, and thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Don't fixate on it, let it go. <laughs> and Ram is saying, God bless Iron Mark. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Beyond that is a wrong to win Beyond that is a right to win There is a field A beautiful field I'll meet you there
Tatsavitur varenya Vargo devas yadim mehi Tio yona vachodayate Savitur Varenia Vargo de Vasia Timahi Tihoyona Pracho Dayate Now we've got floating hearts coming from the online community, <laughs> <laughs> and I have here, I have uh, just so we are on the on the same page from Hindi. ChatGPT says that the translation of the meaning of Gayatri Mantra is, "On the divine essence, we meditate upon the supreme reality, who is the source of all things, who illuminates all realms of existence, who embodies bliss and tranquility." May this divine light enlighten our intellects and guide us on the right path out of intellect. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't just <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, the path out of the of the mind is really the no path. Because there really isn't much of a distance, you know, almost maybe that much of a distance, but it is only only when we assume that mind resides here and it doesn't, and the heart resides here and it doesn't. It really is no distance. It's the paradigm shift, which is uh, so-called immediate, and that's that's what we are contemplating here. And I don't think we have any more comments. You were talking earlier about resistance. Yeah. yeah. When that when that um, appears, I know that everything is love, and I'm love. Something Kat said to me once when I was going through some resistance 
she wasn't trying to help me drop it, but it really, really helped, was was just, uh, it was my cat died, and I was really sad. That's understandable, right? It's my baby of 19 years. And, and then when she died, I was sad, and she said, could you be grateful for your sadness? Because without that, you wouldn't know joy. And then there was this gratitude. It's like, oh, yeah, I can love this sadness. This, this, yeah, oh, yeah, whew. yeah, thank, thankful for this sadness. Wow. Whew. Never been really so grateful to be sad. And guess what happened? I could over, no longer be in grief. You know what I mean? It was like, if you're loving your hatred, are you in hatred? You know what I mean? If you're loving your sadness, well, what happens with that? It's just like it's like the great equalizer, I think. Cool. You know, you can love your love too, but it's like, and then you can't force the love. But it's like, what I what I I think I kind of noticed before meeting Bob even is you could let go, or notice where you're not loving, you know, and then love that. <laughs> you know. I mean, I can't make myself love, but I can love that I'm not loving. You know? Uh, <laughs> the, the resistance is the basic. I always try and look at things very, um, uh, just this logically simple. It's the only way I can travel, you know? Um, so... I just work out that if there's resistance with anything whatsoever, you chain yourself to it. So you to take off that link, it, for me, I just say, oh, you're resisting. Mm -hmm. Bob taught me that. That why you're resisting what was, it's not here anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, so logically you look at it and then I have a sense of freedom. I'm very free around things like that. But it was just that curiosity of the habit that keeps arising. It's like a it's a little spooky that creeps up on you and holds you there for a while. And you can say, oh, that's just resisting. But when it continues to occur, but it's like, you know, Bob said it very simply, stop stirring the cream. That will stay with me. Yeah. Yeah. Which is Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, would yeah. you say the resistance um, is to be embraced? Because obviously in that time and space it stopped you from, it helped you survive maybe or thrive in, in the best way that you know. But in this time and space of nowness, with that awareness, you have skills not to get jammed in survival. And you have more ability to thrive. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, that's beautifully said. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, is, this actually uh, really um, completes, you know, what Maureen was saying. The recognition of resistance is not a resistance to resistance. It's actually embracing the resistance. It's growth. Because, yes, because then you recognize it, and you recognize that you are the field. This beautiful field. That's great because that can happen. stop regret, yeah. getting jammed in regret. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's a beautiful aspect. Yes. It's, oh. it's funny. Yesterday morning, I was sat and had a coffee and out outside was a red rose that you know was just like a bud yesterday afternoon I got home and it had blossomed mm. and I just remembered you know we're for as Bob says you know we're forever changing in every moment so nothing had you know like you'd gone about your day or whatever but it was everything was still sort of the same it just seems to just be flowing and it's just beautiful and yeah just realized how beautiful it was the, it was just still there and everything's just evolving Beautifully, thanks. Mm, yeah, that's a beautiful image. That's a gorgeous image of blossoming rose. And I love, I mm. just wanted to highlight what, what we are both saying. But, mm. you know, Maureen, when you were actually describing uh, how Bob taught you to uh, stop resisting mm. whatever is not happening now. 
because even when that thought arises, of course it arises now, but it doesn't refer to the now. It refers to something that is gone. And that is a, such a beautiful little thing that I wanted to highlight how you put it out. Such a beautiful thing to actually realize. You know, it, the, the thought involves the story about time, about something that is not happening right now. And that's a really good sort of a, a red flag to recognize. Mm -hmm. Not to resist it, not to diminish it, not to say that, that resistance is bad or anything like that. Not to have another thought on top, but just recognize that whatever comes up, and also resistance, my goodness, it is part of survival instinct. Mm -hmm. Resisting the cold and putting the coat. Resisting the pain and, and getting the, the wound healed. Resisting the somebody else's uh, abuse and, and putting stop to it. I mean, if you look at the res resistance in the animal world, resistance gets animals everything they ever get. But they don't have a story mm -hmm. about resistance and they don't bring the past into the present by brooding and and opening those wounds that were healed and they are fully attentive to what is happening and to, and not to what is not exactly because when i uh, to mark when i see the resistance in things sorry when I see that resistance there's many like us all we've all had things in our lives that have caused us mm. great suffering and Therefore, when as soon as I see those thoughts that arise, it's it's easier for me with the thoughts to just see them because they're just thoughts. Yeah. But that resistance, if I chain to the the, I see the resistance. It's a it's a feeling that arises mm -hmm. to let it. So I'm not rejecting it because I'm seeing it. Yeah. But my little logic thing says if I attached, mm -hmm. I'm chaining. Yeah. That's it. As soon as I see that as a visual thing, it's like gone. Mm -hmm. And then sit back in my own freedom, so to speak, when yeah. I say my own freedom. Yeah. Just be freer, for goodness sake, yeah. rather than holding on to all those. Mm. But that was basically coming from Bob in the beginning, saying, well, you're resisting. You tell me about yourself, I do, but you're resisting. Yeah. So resisting was holding me to all the old stories, the old suffering or whatever was going on. Yeah. You know, so now I at least can live in a lot more freedom. I use the word freedom because it's something I can't explain, mm -hmm. space, whatever. But because I can live there more, it was that tiny catch of the habit that came up bit by bit by bit that I couldn't see. Mm -hmm. But now I know exactly where to go mm -hmm. <laughs> with it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh well, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk about that yeah. afterwards. Um, yeah, just to build on everything that's been said here as well, is like I had this thought, well, um, when you go to the gym and you train with weights, it's called resistance training, <laughs> and it makes you stronger, and it's good for you. Um, and But you can also, if you're in the middle of like a, a heavy set, you kind of need to surrender to that resistance mm -hmm. as well, and you need to kind of surrender to that pain to, to push forward. If you start thinking, oh, I don't like this, I don't like it, you'll stop. <laughs> so you see that they, it's all intertwined and it's yeah. it's all one. And, and yeah, like when we start to talk about surrender and, and, and uh, overcoming resistance, it can be very easy to resist resistance like mm -hmm. we've been speaking about. So um, yeah, I just wanted to pop that in. And, and lately as well, what, what's been coming through for me, um, this is kind of another way to conceptualize maybe surrender or non-resistance is like just being one big yes to life. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's got its own like uh, peculiarities and limitations. You know, of course, sometimes saying no to things is not a bad thing. But yeah, just it's saying yes to the no. That yeah, I'm exactly saying. right. So just that kind of all embracing like um, and if you look at people in bhakti or doing worship, um, uh, you know, it's very natural to kind of put your arms open and, and there's a sign of that. It's that heartfelt posture opening up to life. So kind of being that yes to life, um, that's, yeah, kind of everything that we're talk talking about, yeah. Yeah, lovely. Yes yeah. to life. Yeah, mm, yeah. beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a couple of easy messages. From, uh, Vivek says resistance to the individual, the ego, or the other. Ah, okay. Uh, the resistance is a thought, and Peter and Tanya and a few others say thank you, and thank you everyone, and much love, 
And thank you for a great talk. Thank you. So. <laughs> thank you. 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 Thank you